Hello there. Let's do our uh, first plant list of the semester. We are going to cover 10 plants today and we'll be covering 10 plants every time. And uh, this week, the theme is plants with easy to recognize names. So these are plants that have scientific names that are very common that you may actually use the scientific name to commonly refer to the plant. So my intention is to start with the easy ones. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through a list of all 10, I'll show you some photos and I'll give you a brief description of each one. And uh, I go to great lengths to make sure that this is accurate and good information. And it's not always the easiest thing to do. What are some of my primary sources? Well, the number one source that I highly recommend you go and get as a horticulturist is this book. It's the new Sunset Western Garden book, no longer in print. So if you can find it, I encourage you to have it. It's basically like an encyclopedia and it has not too much info, but just the right amount of info. But like any book, it's not being updated. It's printed and it's done. So as things change, we have to modify them. The other uh, classic horticulture text that I use is this monster here called Hortus III, a concise dictionary of plants cultivated in the US and Canada. Two volume set, huge books. And the description in here is very technical. Uh, no photos, no pictures, nothing like that, uh, but it's really precise. So it's very descriptive and talks about exactly how to identify these plants. So those are my two primary sources that I like to use. And then I need to follow that up to make sure that the nomenclature, that the names are accurate. And what resource do I use for that? Well, I use the plantlist.org, the plant list. It's a database that is put together by a lot of different groups, including a couple of world famous botanic gardens. And they focus on looking up the scientific journal article that was the original publication of these plants and then cataloging all of the synonyms. So as the name changes over time, it's something that we can expect uh, to try to, well, we need a resource. We need somebody who's going to uh, be the thing that we rely on to act as our data. So the vast majority of plant names, I refer back to the plant list. And then when it comes to where these plants come from, there is a world checklist of uh, plants and we catalog where the plants come from and that's a separate database I look up. For water use requirements, I use WooCalls, which is a third database. And then I use the IUCN red list for conservation status and the Cal Ipsy, California Invasive Plant Council for an invasiveness standard. So I use all kinds of resources. You're gonna become a little bit familiar with them throughout the class. And so I am curating information and I present it to you here for the purpose of introducing these plant species for our landscape and then having you learn, memorize and become acquainted with them. So here we go. Here is list 1A and I'm calling it practical taxonomy because it's taxonomic names that should be somewhat familiar to you. This is our first 10 in our plant list species. And so you can pause this video, you can speed up the video when you're playing it. You can play it on 1.5 speed or two times speed to make sure that uh, you get through it in time. But you can also just uh, pause, rewind, and go back to different things here and there. Okay, so here we go with our number one plant, our first plant. Every time I'll put these alphabetically by scientific name and uh, they'll be corresponding to the theme of the week. So our first plant here is Acacia baileyana. And the common name, one of the common names is the fern leaf acacia. So uh, the information you see I put here, I'll put the scientific name, then the common name. I'll include the family 
as well as the common family name. You can see this is in the Fabaceae family, which is the legume family. And then I put the location, where is it from? And I try to stick to actual countries and sometimes regions within countries. Uh, but uh, here, the Acacia baileyana is from Australia. And every now and then I'll include important cultivar names. And in this case, purpurea is the cultivated variety that uh, is commonly chosen for the landscape because it has a additional feature of the purple leaf. So as we look at this, we can see it's a tree and it is in the acacia genus. Now there are many different species of acacia and many that are common in the landscape. And we often just refer to them commonly as acacias. So what kind of acacia is this? This is acacia baileyana. This is the fern leaf acacia. Why do they call it the fern leaf? Well, over in that right hand image, you can see that uh, this is a bipinnately compound leaf. So there are small, tiny little leaflets, which are actually uh, really difficult to see in the image because they're so tiny. But uh, this is twice divided as a pinnately compound leaf. So it's bipinnately compound, which gives it that fern type of a look. From a distance, uh, there's a very distinct texture associated. These tend to flower about this time of year in February. In fact, many people are allergic to acacia flowers and I'm one of them. So I'm allergic to the month of February typically. Acacia baileyana is not uh, the worst allergen out there, but if I'm underneath this tree when it's uh, releasing pollen, I'm gonna sneeze. Uh, not typically thorn filled, although many acacias can be uh, uh, containing thorns. So this one is an ornamental plant and a uh, beautiful feature in the landscape, typically would be included as a focal point. It's a tree up to about 25 feet tall typically. And uh, you can see the yellow blossoms on the side and the purple in the third image there is our purpurea cultivar. The acacia, baileyana, is a low water use plant in San Diego. So what that means is it only takes between like 10 and 30% of the water that you would need to keep grass alive, like a cool season grass. So this is much more drought tolerant than a lawn. And that's how we measure drought tolerance in California. So this is uh, classified as a low water use plant, drought resistant. And those flowers when they are blooming can be an attractant to pollinators, including some birds, but mainly for our bees and our insects. They're really attracted to the acacia baileyana, really all the acacia flowers. In Australia, this is commonly referred to as the Kutamundra wattle. And wattle is a common name that's given to a lot of different types of acacias. And that's referring to um, how it was used by people historically as a, uh, a, a building material. And so wattle was a method of weaving branches together in order to build walls. And they called it wattle and daub similar to like a straw bale or like an adobe type of a building, uh, the wattle uh, can come from the acacia branches, strong branches. So in Australia, they call it the Kutamundra wattle, but in the United States, we typically call it the fern leaf acacia. Many different acacia species can become invasive. So they become problematic. And in California, we have a few acacias that I would not recommend you plant because they have the tendency to escape cultivation. However, the acacia baileyana does not display those invasive characteristics, at least not here in California. But in other parts of the world, it may be invasive and naturalized and introduced and would be something you would not want to uh, introduce. But in California, you're okay with this acacia in particular. 
Uh, this flower is used in, throughout Europe and it's prized as a, um, a cut flower. So for the florists and floral arranging and designs, uh, this, when it is in bloom, it can be cut and incorporated into uh, floral bouquets and is a valuable filler plant to uh, take up space and really kind of balance out a floral design. And there are a few other cultivars as well, uh, including weeping or even it's kind of a ground cover growth habit. But uh, for us, most often, you'll see the, the purple leaf cultivar as the one that people really like. So here we go. This is our first plant. This is the fern leaf acacia. It's in bloom right now, so you can go out and find it. And this is Acacia baileyana, fern leaf acacia. Next up, we have Aeonium arboreum, commonly called the tree Aeonium. So Aeonium is the genus. There are several different Aeoniums out there. And Aeonium arboreum, what does arboreum arbor? It's the tree Aeonium. This is a very common succulent in our landscape. And you'll see these uh, low growing, uh, not quite a ground cover, but more of like a, a focal point. Sometimes you see them in groups. They're very common in succulent gardens, uh, surrounded by kind of gravel pebbles and rocks. And there are a couple different cultivars. This one is in the stone crop family which is a broad family that contains many different type, many different succulent type of plants. And this one in particular comes from the Canary Islands, which is in the Atlantic Ocean and has a climate very similar to Southern California. It's quite dry and it's in that Mediterranean uh, landscape, but because it's an island, there's a lot of very rare, unique and uh, characteristic plants. So the Aeonium arboreum, uh, in our landscape, we will see the true form, the, the, the standard species, which is that green plant on the left, the left two images that you see. And then when you look on the right-hand side, you can see kind of a purplish one, as well as so dark in color that it's almost black. And those are cultivated varieties of tree Aeonium as well. Same species, and you can go out there and find different colors. Uh, in particular, the darkest color leaf that people like is called Zwartkopf, which is kind of a fun name to say, Zwartkopf. So that's the image on the very right-hand side. These typically have a height of only about two feet tall. And also, these are flowering right about now, so you can see them starting to put off their blooms. They're uh, typically a yellow, kind of a spike of blooms that arise once a year. And uh, the bloom can last quite a while through the spring and summer. They're, these are often considered to be like sculptural plants. They have an interesting shape and texture and are nice as focal points or little small features uh, one place people like to put them is in and around swimming pools. They're not really damaged by being close to a swimming pool. They're good for a Mediterranean garden and a coastal garden because they're an island species. So the salt in the air will not uh, be a problem for this plant. A lot of people choose to put these in a pure succulent garden, but uh, my personal preference is to mix in some non-succulents with your succulent species. So maybe some ornamental grasses or some flowering shrubs in and amongst the Aeonium uh, gives a really nice balanced look. These are fine in containers, so you can keep them in uh, decorative pots and containers and they're a nice feature that could even be moved around inside of a landscape. As a succulent, these would be a very low water use plant, meaning you almost could get away with zero irrigation. With our very low water use plants, a little bit of irrigation throughout the summer, meaning like once every two weeks, 
would be a good amount of irrigation just to keep them looking healthy and keep the dust off the plants. But ultimately, if it's very low water use, then it's something that could survive here perfectly fine without any supplemental irrigation. As a succulent, however, these are not very happy in places where it freezes. So it's pretty much standard of any succulent species, anything that holds water inside of the leaves uh, does not like to freeze because that water can expand. So these would be ones you would keep on the coastal areas and avoid in parts of San Diego County where there's any frost. This plant is, uh, because it's the succulent and the coastal Mediterranean climate, this one is uh, a characteristic plant in any of the five Mediterranean climate regions. And when you see it around it, you know you're in California or in South Africa or in Australia, and of course in the Mediterranean, North Africa and Southern Europe. So it's uh, quite interesting, kind of has that underwater, undersea coral type of a look to it. And it's a good one to include in a landscape because it's uh, very appropriate for our climate, won't tend to become invasive, and just has such an interesting and unique look to it. This is Aeonium arboreum tree Aeonium. And next up we have Agapanthus africanus, Lily of the Nile. This is in the Amaryllis family. Uh, it's related to, somewhat related to a lily, although it's not true to the lily family. But this comes from a bulb and it's a monocot. And in nature, this comes from, you can see I have it abbreviated there, Southwest Cape Province, meaning it's from South Africa. And when you, cut, when you talk about South Africa, it's a little bit tricky because there is South Africa, the country, and Southern Africa, the region on the continent. Now this one comes from the country. So agapanthus is typically what we call it. These are agapanthus. The, the specific epithet africanus uh, may or may not be 100% accurate. There's some speculation that the ones that we have commonly in our landscape are technically a hybrid between two different agapanthus. Although most of the nurseries and everybody when they talk about this, they typically choose to use the name agapanthus africanus. So that's what we'll use. Sometimes when you see the name written Lily of the Nile, you'll see hyphens in between all of those words. And that is a convention that some people follow when they're talking about a plant that's named after something that it's not really, because this is not a true lily. So when you write lily of the Nile, you're supposed to put all these dashes in between the words that tells the reader that you are aware it's not a true lily. But I don't use that convention, at least not in this class, because I don't want you to have to memorize whether or not to put a dash because the common names are not that important to get 100% right. The scientific name is the one that you need to get right. And so I just leave the dashes out, don't worry about it. Most of the time we refer to this as agapanthus. Uh, but if you wanted a second common name, it would be Lily of the Nile, agapanthus africanus. Now this plant can be classified as a perennial and what I'm talking about is that this plant is one that is herbaceous in nature and it lives more than one year. So it serves the function of a low growing, soft textured plant, but it's perennial, meaning it doesn't need to be replanted. Of course, like a tree is also a perennial, but when we talk about perennials in this class, as a classification, I'm talking about herbaceous, kind of a soft green, typically low growing, although not necessarily a ground cover. One that you would put in kind of like a flower bed and it is compared to the annuals in flower beds because the perennials do not need to be replanted. 
So this is a uh, low growing perennial, typically uh, two to three feet in height. It has a very long flowering season and typically it's a bluish purplish uh, flower that comes up as a single stalk and then there's a large flower head with a, with a very characteristic look to it. You've definitely seen these in the landscape. They are attracting to birds as well as uh, other pollinators. And in our part of the world, they tend to flower starting around April and through September. So you get a nice long bloom season with this plant. These are good again for the sea coast and they are resistant to wind. So if you uh, have a little bit of a harsh area, these ones will do just fine. And also these are popular in and around swimming pools. And that Lily of the Nile name kind of gives you an image of the Nile River and kind of the desert uh, river oasis. And then you've got these plants in and around the, the margins of the, the banks of the river. And so they're popular landscape plants for pool areas as well. They are water wise because they're that bulb and because they are uh, native to South Africa, which is a uh, drought tolerant and Mediterranean climate. The uh, light color in the flowers sometimes is uh, sought out for designers that are looking for moon gardens. Now, when we say moon garden, we're just talking about a landscape that has some nighttime appeal. And a light colored flower, uh, white or light blue, would have that nighttime appeal. You can see it at night and on the full moon, it's something that will stand out. So this would be good for, uh, this would be good for a moon garden. And this one also is suitable for pots and containers. So you, it can be kept in a decorative container. Definitely a subtropical looking plant. So if you're going for that uh, tropical look in San Diego, mixing some of these in kind of brings in that uh, sort of a Hawaii look while still being drought tolerant. And you'll get the hummingbirds, you'll get the butterflies, and you'll even get the bees and the pollinators coming around for this plant. Because this is a monocot, what that means is it's in the, uh, it's related to grasses and palm trees and lilies and bulb species. It means the leaves are typically basal and they have parallel veins. And uh, so that's one very distinct way that you can recognize this is the, the uh, monocot type of leaf. If you dig down underground, there are rhizomes, which are, you know, underground stems that are uh, storage organs. So it stores water and nutrients, similar to like a ginger in the uh, rhizome of this plant, which is what makes it a bit drought tolerant. This plant will harbor uh, slugs and snails. So if you, have, if you do not want slugs or snails in your garden, you may not want to have this plant, but uh, sometimes including the agapanthus will be a way to take the slugs and snails away from your other plants. And if you are the type of person that goes out there and removes the slugs and snails, just plant one agapanthus and then wait for them all to show up. You can go and pick them off and do what you will with them. Uh, the French use them as escargot. It, it, because it is a fleshy and filled with moisture. It's a firewise plant as well, which means it does not uh, burn very easily at all and would be appropriate in and around houses, especially in regions where uh, wildfire is a concern. So it's a firewise plant. And even though it is succulent, it's very hardy. And so it can withstand freezing temperatures. Of course, it doesn't like to be covered under snow, but if you get a frost, this one's going to do okay. Agapanthus can grow all the way up through Northern California just fine. So there we go with Agapanthus africanus, lily of the Nile. Next up, we have another very common plant in San Diego. This is Jacaranda mimosifolia jacaranda. So here the 
common name is the genus name. Everybody knows these as jacaranda. This is a tree, a relatively low growing tree, 25 to 40 feet tall. It's in the bignonia family, not bignonia, bignonia. And any plant in this family is known for its bell shaped flower typically a very beautiful, very attractive and showy bell-shaped flower. And this one has a bluish purple in its uh, bell-shaped flower and originating in South Central South America. So in the countries of Argentina and Brazil, the specific epithet mimosifolia is referring to the leaf. Folia is a reference to leaf. Flora is a reference to flower. So when we see mimosifolia, we can interpret this as a leaf that is a mimosa type leaf. So mimosa is in the Fabaceae family. A lot of plants in the legume family are just commonly called mimosa and they have that bipinnate leaf pattern. So this jacaranda also has the bipinnate leaf pattern similar to a mimosa, but it's not in the legume family. It's not in the Fabaceae. This is Bignoniaceae. Uh, one way to tell this plant apart when it is not in bloom is the leaves will have a terminal leaflet. So everything's divided, but when you look at the very end, there's a single leaflet pointing out at the tip. That's one thing that's quite characteristic about the jacaranda. Now, unfortunately, this is not flowering right now, so it'll be tricky to find it if you can find it in your landscape. These flower at the end of May and the beginning of June, usually when our class has just ended. So this is the first one you're gonna learn, but it's in the last couple of weeks of the semester that you'll see it in bloom. Now, when we look at drought tolerance and the amount of irrigation, this one is in the medium water use category, meaning it needs more water, more irrigation than the previous plants we've talked about so far. And what that means is if you're going to design a landscape, you want to mix the plants with similar water requirements. So if you put a bunch of uh, tree aeonium, for instance, underneath the jacaranda, you're going to be overwatering the tree aeonium. We recommend that you try to put similar water use requirements together. And this one is a medium water use, meaning it takes about 50% of the irrigation that you would put on grass. Now, it's quite common in our landscape. And in our landscape, the biologists would say it's not contributing much value to the ecosystem because the urban environment is not really an intact ecosystem like a wild environment is. However, in its native habitat, this one is vulnerable. So it, the habitat is reducing for the wild species. So actually planting some plants that are threatened in their native habitat can be a good thing for conservation because just in case we need to get some cuttings sometime in the future and uh, try some different varieties to keep the species alive. We're going to have a reservoir up here in San Diego of Jacaranda mimosifolia. So as a vulnerable plant in its native habitat, you can do some conservation work by incorporating it in other parts of the world where it grows just fine for the climate. This is a common shade tree in our landscape and a good one to incorporate into public parks. Uh, it does drop the flowers. So after their bloom in the month of June, the flowers will drop and they stay on the ground for quite a while and can make a little bit of a mess. So people don't usually like them on sidewalks or parking lots, but in landscape areas, public parks, they're beautiful when the flowers drop in the grass and even in people's homes, if they have a lawn, a nice canopy of jacaranda really helps to bring in a dappled shade and things can grow under it just fine. 
you do want to watch out if you're going to walk barefoot on the jacaranda flowers because even when the flowers fall, bees will still tend to go inside to pollinate the flowers. And so you want to watch out for uh, bee stings on the feet. Don't walk barefoot through the jacaranda flowers. But it's a very common tree to incorporate into public parks. And even though people recommend against it in parking lots and sidewalks, you see it as a street tree. And so it's a common uh, landscape tree, especially for San Diego and LA, Southern California. Uh, people like to put them on their patio or on their courtyard and they're relatively tidy except that one month out of the year when they're gonna drop their flowers. There's really no risk of it from becoming invasive and so uh, San Diego County really encourages planting this tree quite a bit. There are other species of jacaranda that can be planted in the landscape. In Southern California, this is the one we, we go with. So everyone just calls it jacaranda. But in other places, a little bit more of a subtropical or even tropical climate, there are yellow flowering jacaranda species, and in places where you see multiple different species, this one they call the blue jacaranda. But here we just call it jacaranda because it's kind of the only one you see planted. You really only see the yellow jacaranda at uh, botanical gardens or the zoo, San Diego Zoo. Uh, if you ever get on the, the shuttle, the two-story bus at the zoo, when you get on, you can look to your right as you're waiting to take off and you'll see a really tall yellow flowering jacaranda, different species. And one other very interesting uh, characteristic of this plant is the seed pod. It produces a woody seed pod that's round in shape and quite unique and uh, a very distinct shape. There's not really anything else like it. Those woody seed pods uh, I would imagine people could use them for all sorts of things. I always see them and think they could become some kind of like, uh, I don't know, jewelry earrings or something like that. But uh, I don't know of any particular uses, but uh, take a look at the woody seed pods when after the flowers have been pollinated. And uh, it's quite an interesting feature of the plant. The wood itself is a a popular wood for carpentry and turning. And so it's got very unique uh, colors. It's kind of white inside and typically very straight in the grain without a whole lot of imperfections, which makes it a valuable species for using as uh, carpentry to build things with. Here we don't usually build out of jacaranda because we don't grow it like a plantation, but if you ever have a chance to build something with a jacaranda branch, that's going to be a, a, a good wood to use. In San Diego, uh, the jacaranda was brought to us by a legendary historical botanist named Kate Sessions, horticulturist botanist. And a lot of the plants that we have in our landscape today were imported by Kate Sessions. She was kind of an early explorer of exotic plants that did well in San Diego. So the jacaranda is one of the claims to fame of legendary horticulturist Kate Sessions. She introduced it to San Diego and LA and uh, Southern California region. There's one little story about the jacaranda that I like. I wanna try to steal it and use it at Southwestern College, but at, uh, in Australia, uh, in their late spring, early summer uh, season, the flowering of the jacaranda trees corresponds with finals week. And so uh, there's a common phrase in uh, some of the universities in and around Queensland, Australia, they call it purple panic. Once you see the jacaranda trees putting off purple flowers, it's time to panic because it's your finals season. And uh, some people call it the exam tree because when you see jacaranda blooming, it's time to take your final exams. So we have that at Southwestern College too. 
if you start to see the jacaranda putting off flowers, then it is the time for purple panic. Get ready to study for your final exams. I think that's kind of neat. So there you go, jacaranda, mimosifolia, jacaranda. And now we have a beautiful vine species. This is jasminum polyanthum, pink jasmine. Jasmine gets a little bit tricky because there are many different plants. Most of them are vines, but there are many different plants we call jasmine. And they have different common names and they have different scientific names. This one, jasminum polyanthum, is one of the many different things that are called jasmine. But because the genus is jasminum, it's pretty easy to know that this is a jasmine. And this plant in particular is known for its wonderful sweet fragrance. When it is in bloom, it is it, you can smell it from a long way away. It's quite distinct, very pleasant, uh, very perfume-esque. And like many other plants that are called jasmine, the scent is a little bit more strong at night. So sometimes you'll be walking at night and you'll smell this terrific floral scent and it's coming from the pink jasmine. In this case, it's referred to as pink jasmine because of the flowers that are still in bud that have not yet opened up. They have that pink color. So oftentimes you see a combination of white flower with pink buds and it makes for an attractive appearance. Interestingly, this is in the Olaceae, which is the olive family. So it's related to olive and not necessarily related to other plants that we call jasmine. When we talk about a range, this one has a broad range. It goes from South Central China to Myanmar or Myanmar. And uh, you can get into politics now because Myanmar is also referred to as Burma. And so there, and even if you look in the news right now, you'll see there was a recent uh, revolution, military coup. And so whether or not you call the country Myanmar or Burma, you may be pro-democracy or pro something else. I don't even know personally. I use Myanmar because the world checklist of plant families recognizes Myanmar. Although I think the United States they only recognize the name Burma. So you could say it comes from Burma, comes from Myanmar, but I'm going to stick with the data. Now, this pink jasmine is a vine. It, it needs to climb up something. People often have them next to their house or along their fence. They will climb up a trellis or a, a wood or a chain link fence just perfectly fine. They typically are seen about 10 to 15 feet in height. And oftentimes when you talk about the height of a plant, it's also the width of the plant too. It'll typically be about as wide as it is tall. So this would be like a 10 to 15 foot vine. I'm sure it could get much taller and longer, but usually you see it relatively compact. It has a very long bloom season in the first half of the year. So it's just starting to get into bloom right now and it will pick up and become more prolific as the months continue. The primary uh, reason to plant this is for fragrance. So if you're really looking for a beautiful fragrance, the pink jasmine is definitely one of the plants out there that you should be considering. Because of its native range, it also has uh, sort of that Asian garden plant palette. So if you were trying to do a Japanese garden or sort of a Southeast Asian uh, inspired garden, then this would be a good plant to use as well. As far as water use requirements, this is in line with the jacaranda. This is a medium water use plant, meaning it takes a bit of extra irrigation, but not as much irrigation as watering a cool season lawn. One of the other common names for this is a translation of the scientific name, polyanthem, which means many flowered. So some people call this the many flowered jasmine. Uh, here we typically call it the pink jasmine. 
In Australia and New Zealand, this one has the tendency to become invasive, although in California, it's not really a problem. Because it's a medium water use plant, Southern California, it may not be the first choice, but if you go into Santa Barbara and North, they get more rain than we do, and then it becomes much more climate appropriate. We don't have to worry about it becoming invasive here. We got to give it a little extra water. If you have a wet spot in your garden, uh, this can tolerate sun or shade. It's very hardy, and it's a good one to choose to really bring in that beautiful fragrance. The Jasminum polyanthum pink jasmine. Next up, we have Lantana camera. You can say Camara, camera. You can pronounce these however you want. I recommend you pronounce them so that you can remember how to spell them. And you may hear other people eventually start to use pronunciations that are much more recognized, and so you go with that. Uh, if you speak another language, perhaps uh, that language will help to inform how to pronounce, pronounce the Latin name, but there's really no rule about how to pronounce it. So I try to pronounce every vowel so that it helps me to remember how to spell it. So Lantana, Camara, Lantana, Camara. Commonly, we call this the bush, Lantana, because Lantana is the genus name and it's typically what we call it. This is in the Vervain family, native to Mexico and tropical America. It has a broad range, uh, but uh, not native to North America. So it doesn't come from here, but just a little bit further south into Mexico when you get into that subtropical climate. And this one's very common in our landscape. It even has a little bit of a tendency to escape cultivation. So you may wanna be careful planting this if you are near a canyon or an open space. But in the landscape, it's not one that's gonna cause a huge amount of problem. And it's so hardy and so prolific in its blooms that it's worthy of our attention. This is a shrub that gets between six and 10 feet tall. So it can be a larger shrub, uh, often seen as a hedge. So you can put them together in a, in a line and kind of have a evergreen hedge that is hardy and will produce prolific flowers. You may not wanna put it right up against a sidewalk because you'll have to trim it back repeatedly. So give it some room and it will do just fine. This, in our climate, this one will flower year round. You get year round blooms on it. And those blooms are attracting to all sorts of different pollinators, but in particular butterflies. Butterflies really like small clusters of flowers. And so whenever you see little clusters, that's a indicator that a many different butterfly species may come to visit that flower. Although this one is also attracting of birds and bees as well. It's on a watch list for invasiveness, meaning it's not conclusive that it will certainly become invasive, but you may want to watch out which is why I say if you're close to a canyon or an open space habitat, this may be one that you consider not including, but otherwise it should be just fine. It's very hardy, meaning it's resistant to wind. It's resistant to the salt spray on the seacoast. It's a good one to plant around swimming pools as well. Can handle containers. It's drought tolerant, low water use. So uh, everything about it makes it just a, a really resilient plant and really good for our landscape. It's quite common. So uh, once you start looking for it, you'll see it all over the place. It's a decent one for uh, fire-wise landscaping, not going to contribute to uh, burning in and around the house. And because it comes from tropical Americas, it uh, also has that kind of tropical look which is typically what we're going for in San Diego. We want things to look nice and lush if you're choosing a subtropical plant palette. There is some fragrance uh, with these flowers, although nothing near as close to uh, some other plants we'll talk about, including the jasmine that we just discussed.
There are other lantana species that we have commonly in the landscape, and there's some cultivated varieties as well, as well as the tendency for these to hybridize or cross with each other. But the standard uh, lantana camera, uh, the bush lantana, is this yellow to red uh, kind of spectrum of flower color. It gives it sort of a sunset look. Um, this one, because it's so hardy and because it has the tendency to become invasive in many parts of the world, this one is one that people hate. They don't like it. In particular, the farmers don't like it because this is one that'll come in and uh, colonize uh, ground that has been disturbed. So if you're trying to graze animals or if you're trying to have a farm, this can be a problem for you. And a lot of the, the tropical, subtropical farmers are always trying to rip out and destroy lantana. Here, it can become a little bit of a problem in our wildland, but we're just a little on the dry side for this to really become that invasive species that is a problem in other areas. Uh, part of the reason the farmers don't like it for the livestock is it's toxic. So it will be toxic to animals, cows, sheep, goats, horses, anything that grazes on the ground. And so this has been given the designation of a noxious weed. Noxious weed is not really a scientific term. Many things are called noxious weeds, but historically it, that term is reserved for things that will make your livestock get sick. So sometimes they call native plants noxious weeds. But uh, in our case, uh, we, we think of weeds as non-native invasive species. So there's a lot of uh, research out there and a lot of uh, material about how to get rid of lantana. Whereas in our landscape, we're planting lantana because it's so hardy and because it's a very reliable plant that doesn't take much water. So it's all about the context, the appropriate context. A plant in the wrong spot can be a problem, but a plant in the right place uh, will cause no problems and will actually solve some solutions. So it does provide habitat and it provides green space and it can be a perfectly uh, well-maintained part of a San Diego landscape. It's certainly quite common and should, it is important to recognize it. But you want to be cautious. You want to not apply something that's appropriate to San Diego to another climate or another uh, application because it can cause a problem in those other applications. So here we have lantana, camera, the bush lantana. And now we have another quite famous shrub, lavandula dentata. French lavender. And lavender is in the mint family, related to sage. And uh, one of the characteristics of a mint family is the stem is square. So if you go and you feel the plant, it's going to have four ridges or four corners. It's a square stem, which is characteristic of Lamiaceae or the mint family. This one comes from the Mediterranean. And it has the name of French lavender. So of course it comes from France, but it's also found throughout the Mediterranean, including uh, Africa and the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula as well. The specific epithet of dentata is referring to the leaf. Take a look at the photo of the leaf and see all the, the margin of the leaf. And do you notice the, the edge and how it kind of goes in? And it's not wavy, but it's very, and it's also not sharp. So it's not serrate and it's not undulate. This is dentate, it's toothed. This has a toothed margin. Looks like a row of teeth on the edge. And that's how you know it's the French lavender. French lavender is one of the ones that is common here as a landscape plant. It's a little bit larger of a shrub compared to some of the other lavenders that might be grown. And like some of the others, lavender is grown for its attractive fragrance, its uh, unique foliage. The foliage is fragrant, the flowers are fragrant, the color is uh, beautiful, it's very climate appropriate and hardy, and this will attract a lot of beneficial wildlife as well. 
The name lavender and lavandula comes from the Latin root of to wash. And so the fragrance in this plant, the oils that are contained within the leaves and the flowers have been popular for many, many years, uh, perhaps even thousands of years in creating soaps and uh, fragrances for cleaning. So a lot of people like to use lavender oil in their cleaning and you can get soaps and shampoos and things that have a lavender fragrance even today. And the name lavender means use it to wash because it's gonna make your clothes smell good. Like many of our other plants, this is quite hardy. So it'll be drought tolerant and it's good for sea coasts. It's uh, great for fragrance. And then again, that kind of light color is the moon garden, uh, the moon garden effect. And it's okay for pots and containers as well. If you're interested in a Mediterranean garden or like a French or English, even an Italian kind of a garden look, formal garden, the lavender is a good one to incorporate. And a low growing hedge as well. Oftentimes these are seen in a line and they can be pruned or, or shaped to look like one long row of hedge. And so it would be relatively low growing, not something that would block your view too much, but they look good in a formal setting too, in straight lines. And as a historic plant, this is definitely one that uh, has a lot of cultural significance. And it has, uh, in many ways, lavender has been part of uh, shaping the world and the global economy throughout our history. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of context with lavender, all the different lavender species. Another name for this uh, commonly would be fringed lavender and not French lavender. And that's referring to the texture, the toothed edges of those leaves. So that's really the way that you identify this plant is with the leaf shape. But then you can also use the flower shape and it has sort of an elongated uh, flower that blooms at the end of a stalk. Uh, the spikes, what these are referred to, flower spikes, on this plant are quite slender, quite narrow. And typically the, the petals, which are uh, not necessarily always petals, they may be modified leaves that are this purple color, uh, usually appear in the late spring along with the fragrance and usually are found at the top of the flower spike. So there we go. One of our common lavender species in the landscape Lavandula dentata, French lavender. And next up we have Nerium oleander, commonly called oleander. So have you noticed that most of the times we use a common name that's the same as a scientific name? It's the genus, Jasminum, Lavandula, Lantana, Jacaranda, but in this case, it's the specific epithet, that second name in the scientific name. Oleander is how we refer to Nerium oleander. Another Mediterranean plant, and here you see Mediterranean all the way through to, again, Myanmar, or, and this is in the dogbane family. Famously, oleander is uh, poisonous. And so uh, you don't want to consume this plant. You don't want your animals to consume this plant, but it is quite uh, climate appropriate and very hardy. There are many different flower cultivars. And because it has these toxic compounds, there have been historical uses of this plant for some medicinal purposes. Although I'm no doctor and I'm no herbologist, so I'll never give you a prescription or even a recommendation to use plants in any way that could potentially harm you or others. That's on you to decide how you will interact with these plants. Do your own research. But you can see the flower color ranging from white to pink to a sort of a deeper uh, reddish pink. Uh, this is an evergreen taller shrub, which makes a beautiful backdrop or a hedge or a screen in a landscape. 
there are some horror stories out there of people using oleander as firewood and even the smoke from the burning oleander can cause you problems. And like, uh, for instance, you never want to roast a marshmallow on an oleander stick. It could get some of those uh, toxic compounds in your body. So it's one you want to watch out for. It's one that nowadays a lot of people are shying away from. But historically, it's been a very popular landscape plant in San Diego. In fact, you can see a lot of them on our freeways between the north and south uh, bound lanes on the freeway. You see typically lots of oleander shrubs planted. It has a very long bloom season, typically from February to November. It only takes a little bit of a break in the winter time. Uh, if you're working with this plant and you know pruning it back or trimming it, you because of its toxicity, you do want to uh, have some caution with it because the sap of the plant could potentially get in there and uh, give you some irritation. So you want to be a little bit cautious, but it's bitter. It doesn't taste good. So you don't usually have to worry about people or even animals choosing to eat this plant. So although, yes, it is toxic, it's not necessarily common that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of animals, including people, having issues or problems. But if you're working with it, you may want to consider some gloves or some long sleeves. But beyond that, it is a popular ornamental plant. It's been in our landscape for many decades. It's very good to be able to recognize it when it's there. And uh, it's, I think it has a place. I think in the right place and the right time, it is a perfect plant for a, a Southern California, Mediterranean and climate appropriate garden. The only thing you wanna watch out for these days is a uh, pest called uh, leaf scorch, oleander leaf scorch. And that's a, a disease that comes from a, a pest. The pest introduces the disease. And if you are on a vineyard, that disease could translate over to your, your grapes. So you wanna watch out for having this on a vineyard, but other, otherwise uh, it's gonna be just fine. And you may or may not see some of the plants in our landscape now succumbing to the disease of oleander leaf scorch. Nerium oleander, oleander. And so next up we have Olea europea, the olive. And do you notice the similarity between Olea, the genus, and oleander, the specific epithet? Well, they're related because the oleander looks like olive. The leaf shape is somewhat similar. Now, the olive tree is one of the oldest, uh, most long-term uh, cultivated plants in history. Of course, olive oil is something that uh, we're all familiar with as a cooking oil and a fuel source. And the olive was one of the primary plants in the Mediterranean region that established entire civilizations. So it's a very long-lived tree. In fact, some olive trees can be thousands of years old, still living today. And they get a very uh, twisted and gnarled and quite beautiful trunk. Uh, but it takes a long time for them to get that growth habit. And you have to do something special to keep them growing for that long. You actually have to harvest the olives and you have to trim them every year. If you do nothing, it'll not live quite as long, but it's gonna live hundreds of years for sure and can get to be about 40 to 60 feet tall. It's a perfectly drought adapted, climate appropriate plant. Uh, it comes from the Mediterranean, more, more in particular, the North African side of the Mediterranean and even all the way through India and South Central China. In our landscape, a lot of times, olive trees are incorporated and there's a special cultivar that has been selected that does not produce olives. So uh, for the public plants, people like to not have to go clean up the stain of the olives falling. However, historically, the olives that were planted in California as part of the California missions were planted to produce olives so that people could consume them as uh, preserved olives and olive oil. 
And many times though, the ones in the streets will not produce olives and people will look for the non-fruiting olive varieties. Because of the historical significance, there's many cultures throughout the world in Mediterranean regions that, uh, that have a, an association with the olive tree. And so it kind of brings up a historical or a classical significance. There's a lot of Renaissance artwork that displays the olive tree. And when you see the olives, a lot of people kind of have this historical or sort of a nostalgic feeling in the landscape, a lot of people like to see them as patio trees. So you, you'd want it kind of by itself as a focal point or a specimen. They can be pruned to many different shapes and can develop a very attractive and ornamental form. A lot of times you'd mix this in and around shrubs and some smaller perennials and you'd even put lights so that at night this is lit up so that it has sort of a sculptural effect in the garden. In San Diego, if you go hiking on some of the trails, you may see wild olive, which is an escaped olive that has escaped cultivation and become an invasive species. So this is one of the ones where you're, if you're on a border of a, an open space or a wild land, you may not plant the olive because it could have the, t the tendency to hop over the fence and become a problem, but it's not one of the worst invasive species out there. There's really no restrictions against planting it right now. And it will grow alongside many of our native plants. And so if you are growing California natives, sometimes other things don't like to mix with California natives, but the olive tree being quite hardy and from a coastal Mediterranean climate is gonna do just fine around our native plants. So keep it in the urban area. Don't plant it in the urban wildland interface. When it comes to olive being a, being an, a food source and the fruit being edible, uh, you probably know that most raw olives cannot really be eaten that way. They're strong in taste and they're filled with some compounds that would not be pleasant for your digestion, but uh, they can be preserved. They can be uh, fermented and pickled and salted and produce the olives that we eat. And then of course, there's the oil. There's many different cultivars if you're looking to produce olive oil here in San Diego. One of the problems though, is we've got a pest in our region that tends to destroy the olives before they are ripe enough for making oil. About 100 years ago, there was an effort to turn San Diego into an olive oil region. And that ended up working for a little while. But then once the pest came through, it was hard to produce olives commercially. You can still make some olive oil if you've got a tree or two and you're not surrounded by a bunch of others on a farm. Uh, but as a, as a farming initiative or as an economic part of San Diego, olives are not really big in our region. They can be grown and there are other cultivars that can do okay. And we've got uh, some advanced techniques that help with uh, ripening. So we can do an artificial ripening to get the fruit ready before it, uh, before it has problems, before it oxidizes and becomes blackened and all those sorts of things. But uh, Europe is still, especially Italy, Spain, France, is still the primary uh, world famous region for producing olive oil. A lot of people, when they eat olive oil, they want to have the extra virgin, cold pressed and highest quality, which ironically is important that you get the olive oil from California because it's labeled appropriately and a few years ago, it came out that if you buy the olive oil from uh, European countries, a lot of times their labeling standards are not as good. So many times you think you're getting olive oil, but you're getting a mix of olive oil and some other stuff. So if you're looking for the best of the best, the California olive oil is the one to go for. But ironically, in Southern California, San Diego, we're not the prime region for producing it.
although it's a perfectly happy landscape plant. So here we have Olea, Europea, Olive. And here we have our final plant on the list. This is Pitosporum tobira, mock orange. You may look at those two names. You say, how is mock orange related to Pitosporum tobira? The reason I include that here is mock orange is one of the common names, but honestly, most people just call this Pitosporum. So you may have heard of Pitosporum plants. Here is one of the most common pitosporums that people plant. It's in its own unique family and they call it the cheese wood family. It's got a distinct fragrance and uh, look when you look at the wood. This one comes from Asian countries, Japan, China, and Korea. It's called the mock orange because it sort of resembles a citrus tree in the waxiness of its leaf as well as in the blossom. And these blossoms are quite sweet and fragrant when they produce their uh, flower. And you'll smell this one at night, just like you'll smell a lot of other flowers at night. Here in San Diego, this is a moderate water use plant, similar to a citrus tree actually. And we typically consider it a, sh a shrub and not a tree. Although if left alone, it can get quite, quite tall and can get up to 10 to 15 feet tall. There are some cultivars that are commonly uh, planted in the landscape, sometimes a variegated cultivar, which means you have uh, light color and dark color striping in the leaf. And another one that's quite common is a low growing cultivar called the Wheeler's Dwarf. The standard species, Pitosporum tobira, is uh, great for a hedge, a screen. It's tolerant of some shade, so it could be a one of the shrubs planted underneath a taller tree. So if it's only in partial shade, this plant will do just fine and kind of can give you that woodland garden look. So this could be sort of a, a, a understory, kind of a trees and shrubs that you see as a layer in the forest if you're looking for a woodland garden theme and also would be appropriate for an Asian garden plant palette. Uh, this plant is planted throughout the world as a common ornamental plant, as well as uh, a plant that's prized for its foliage. So you cut the branches and you can mix that in again with floral designs. And so it's uh, evergreen, just kind of helps to green up your landscape and in a dry area will give you that bit of color throughout the summer that helps your garden to feel like an oasis. But because this plant is not a true Mediterranean climate species, it may be a little bit more susceptible to drought and dry conditions, especially when it's younger, which means that as you water this plant, you wanna pay particular attention to the summertime and make sure it never goes too dry throughout the summer. So this is gonna be one that's gonna be needed to be planted with other plants that are looking for summertime water. So there we have it with our final plant on the list, Pitosporum tobira, mock orange, or commonly referred to as the Pitosporum. So I hope that was interesting and intriguing this is my explanation of these plants to you. You're gonna to need to do some independent study. The first thing you focus on is linking the common name to the scientific name and get used to that those are the two names you need to remember. And then start focusing on the plant itself, the photographs and the images and connecting that to the name. Uh, look around town, start paying attention, open your eyes. Look for interesting specimens. Take some photos when you see them, in particular when they're flowering. That's the time of the year to check it out. And this is uh, the introduction to our semester of exploring about the plants in our landscape. These are the ones with the easily recognizable names. Each week from here on out, we'll have a different theme that will focus on some sort of uh, reason 
for assembling these plants in the collections as we do. So I hope you found it interesting and informative, and I hope it helps to open your eyes for some of the things that are out there in our world around us.